Oh, really, really excited to have you. So, so I wanted to start the, um, you know, that story about about founding founding Airbnb and and uh, you know sort of thinking through, you know, how to how to meet rent. And the thing that's always stuck out to me about that is, you know, people people will say, you know, pay attention to detail and think about your consumer. But like, when I read that story, there, it's always jumped out at me that you guys thought about like a bowl of change for your guests to give to the homeless people, which is like, who, who the fuck thinks of that? It's crazy, right? So just love for you to talk about sort of how you guys sort of thought through creating that experience and, and what that taught you about sort of the power of thinking through details and, and obviously that flows through the experience you're creating for your users and your guests and your hosts uh, today. Yeah, awesome question. Ooh. So it, I, what I love about the founding of Airbnb is that it's a classic design story. You're faced with a problem, some insurmountable challenge, and you've got your back against the wall, the clock is ticking, and you've got to somehow pull some kind of creative move out of thin air to save the day at the last minute. And that's exactly what happened with Airbnb. But it's exactly what we learned in design school, if you think about it. So Airbnb is really just an extension of what we learned at, in industrial design and graphic design. Um, this idea that uh, you can observe a problem and th with design thinking or design perspective or design ethos, you can see two dots that don't make any sense, but somehow in your head you can connect them in a new and a different way. And, and so, so specifically, like the the change, like how did the you change? The change. Wants like to know how, the change. Yeah, I want to know, like, where, like, who's who said that first? Like, we got to have change for like people are going to come out. There's always homeless people. They're not used to that. Like, how, like, where did that come cool. from? Cool. So uh, the apartment where, where I the start and where uh, I still live is in Soma. It's down on Seventh and Folsom. And uh, if anybody lives in Soma, you know the uh, the color of Soma. And uh, it's very colorful outside our doorway. Uh, and so as we were thinking through the experience of, of what we wanted to do for our guests, um, uh, well, I should probably back up real quick uh, just to give the context of how we got to that. So in 2007, the IDSA has their international design conference right here in San Francisco. It was the first time in like, like 25 years that it had been in the city. And sure enough, it's so big that the hotels sell out throughout San Francisco. And uh, Brian, my roommate, who's also a designer, and I are, are faced with the rent check. And, and we just noticed that, that designers are, they're like, uh, we heard from our friends that like, my friend wants to come to the conference, but there's no place to stay. We have airbeds in the closet, so we pull out the airbeds. And we're standing there in the living room, and we're looking at these, <laughs> these airbeds on the floor, and we're like, okay, well, that, that doesn't look too exciting. What else can we do to make this an experience, to make this something that's more than just sit, sleeping on an airbed in our living room? And that's when we started thinking through, well, what else do you do when you travel? Well, uh, I guess you come to the airport, so uh, why don't we come up with a guide of how to get from the airport to our apartment? And once they get to the apartment, we'll come up with a way for them to, to learn about the neighborhood, like, like Brainwash Cafe and uh, uh, the wine bar and the Rocco's for breakfast. So we came up with a neighborhood guide. Uh, and then we kept thinking through the experience. Well, like, design's playful, so let's make something playful about this. Well, let's make t-shirts for them that said, I stayed at the air bed and breakfast, 2007. And as if it was like some big thing, right? It was just our living room. Uh, and, then, and then we thought through the whole experience, okay, they're gonna be going to the conference every day, which means they're gonna walk outside the door, which means that they're gonna probably trip over somebody, maybe out on the sidewalk, because of the color of Soma. And we thought, well, you know, they're always asking us for change, so why don't we just make it easy for them? We don't have to, they don't have to think twice about it. We'll just give them the spare change to give out. So it's kind of like thinking through the whole entire journey of our three guests, even before they arrived. Right, right. And so how much of that do you think was, was you guys knowing and sort of imagining what it would be like if you were to arrive in San Francisco and come have this experience? And how much was sort of knowing your guest, right? So <laughs> not, and not specifically, but sort of right. these are designers. They're coming like imagining kind of the 40-year-old guy and, you know, right, the... Right the 20 year old student and you, know, you kind of knew that. So how much was about the consumer and how much was about sort of you guys imagining yourselves as consumer? I think this is classic design right here where uh, what we were taught was in school we were taught to become the patient, right? Like if we were working on a medical device, it was like we would we'd go out into the world, we would go talk with all of the stakeholders, all the, 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 the users of that product, the, the doctors, the nurses, the patients, and then, then we would have that epiphany moment where we lay down in the bed in the hospital, we'd have the device of whatever the existing product was applied to us, and we would sit there and feel exactly what it felt like to be the patient. Yep. 
And it was in that moment where you start to go, aha, that's really uncomfortable. <laughs> There's probably a better way to do this. And so by becoming the patient, I think it just, for us, it opened up so many different types of insights. And it's, I mean, I, I share this example of, yeah, we did it with an airbed and change and breakfast, but it's, it's, it's one of those things that's every person on our design team, like that's like a core, that's a core value of the design team, like becoming the patient. And how, how do you teach that? So when people come in, is that something that when you interview, you sort of look mm. for that? Or, and then obviously you must foster it sort of in your design team. So how do you kind of make sure that that continues as a, as a value? Yeah, I mean, you can tell in an interview if someone's used the product or not. I mean, you can ask them. Um, but usually people who've used it come with a story of some kind. They say, well, you know, I use it. And then I wish you guys did search this way. Like, why do you do it that way? And like, hey, come with some kind of insight as to how to make it better. Um, and actually, on, on day one, so anytime there's uh, a new group of uh, teammates that join the team, that, um, they actually all go on a trip together. Uh, or at least not together, but they take a trip the first week <laughs> that they come to the company. And they actually document they stay at the, the Westin. Trip. They stay at the Westin. Uh, sometimes that's books, so they go to the Ritz. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> they document the whole experience. And uh, they come back and they actually present to the entire team. So they share their findings. Uh, as, uh, as a Sorry, just to, to clarify, guest. when you say team, is that the entire design team or the entire product That's the team, entire, entire company. Entire company. It's a, you know, about a room this size with this many people. Um, it doesn't matter what department you're in. So this is customer service, this is a community team, this is uh, the talent team, this is finance. It doesn't matter. Everybody takes a trip in their first or second week in the company, and then they document it. Uh, we have some structured questions that they answer you know, about user research, and then they actually share back to the entire company. Uh, so it's incredibly important that, that we're Everyone in the company knows that we believe in this so much, we're going to pay for you to go take a trip on your first week. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you've talked about also sort of this idea of sort of doing non-scalable things. So, you know, potentially when you first thought about having everyone who gets hired take a trip in their first week, maybe someone would have said, well, that's not scalable. You can't do that when you have 100 employees or when you're hiring, you know, 100 people in a year. Like, how are you going to do that? So, you know, do you, have, do you have other examples of where you sort of said, like, no, no, this is, this is really critically important for this individual to go do this thing, or I'm going to go do this sort of specific non-scalable thing to learn, um, and how that's inspired, you know, either a specific feature or a specific way of managing a team or, or sort of insight into your consumer? Sure. Right. It's, a, it's a great question, because <coughs> to understand the answer to this question, you have to look at the, the kind of trajectory of the business. Um, a lot of people think that, that Airbnb was like an overnight success, which couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, started in 2007 in our apartment, that one weekend for IDSA, and then about 2008 we officially, you could say, launched, and then we, that didn't go over so well, so then we changed and we launched again, and that didn't go over so well, so we changed and we launched again. That's when Visa did your Series A. <laughs> That's right. Um, so there's been like five launches in the history of the company, but people don't really know about one of them. Right. The other four were um, basically failures. And, and the reason, I think looking back, I can connect the dots as to why that was. Uh, the reason is that we had this Silicon Valley mentality that, that you had to solve problems in a scalable way. Because that's, that's the beauty of code, right? You can write one line of code that can solve a problem for a one customer or 10,000 or 10 million, mm -hmm. possibly. Uh, and so the first year of the business was us sitting behind our computer screens trying to code our way through problems. And because that's what we thought, you know, that was this kind of like s stigma that we had in our mind, this dogma of, of the way that you were supposed to solve problems in Silicon Valley. And then it wasn't until uh, our first uh, session with, with Paul Graham at Y Combinator where we basically, we had the first time someone gave us permission to do things that don't scale. And it was in that moment, I'm, I'll, I'll never forget it because it, it changed the trajectory of the business. It was in that moment where suddenly like all the weight was lifted off of our shoulders and we actually got to go back to thinking like hyper creatively about how we could grow the business, which at the time wasn't even like it was flatlined. If if not flatlined, it was actually declining. I mean, at this time, like nobody knew about us. Uh, our early customers were actually angry at us because uh, the way we did our payments was not uh, we paid people on checkout rather than on check in because we were we wanted to make sure that the stay went just perfectly. We didn't want to get any chargebacks yep. on the credit card. And uh, host wrote us these angry emails like, "Oh, wh what are you doing?" Like. Uh, why do I have to wait three weeks to get paid? And we're like, gosh, yeah. So it was like the kind of, th it felt like the world was against us. You know, we had investors were saying no to us. Um, our hosts were angry. Um, our parents thought we were crazy. Um, our kind of like lives were like kind of upside down. And um, I just remember the moment where uh, everything turned around. It was really Paul Graham saying, 
it's okay to do things that don't scale. And if I could sum that up in one line, he said to us, go meet the people. And what he meant by that was get out of the apartment, get away from the computers, go out into the real world and meet the people who make up your product, who are consuming your product, go talk to them. So, so for people who, who don't work at a place that sort of encourages them to get out and go do that, like how can they, as either an, you know, an individual contributor, graphic designer, you know, sort of either fresh out of school or first year on the job, like how do you sort of get the ability to do, like when do you do that, how do you do that, and how do you bring that back to your team in a way that people will listen? Like what would you recommend if someone said like, no, they just want me to sit here and, and do these you know, graphics and make sure this button is blue and that one is red and um, you know, I'm driven by data and that's it. Be a pirate. <laughs> just go. Like, <laughs> don't wait for permission. Just go. Like, and then, but then, how do you bring it back? So you have the, you know, you, you have the gun. You leave the building. You go do it, and you bring it back. And then, how do you sort of? And it says, no, actually, the, they shouldn't be blue and red. They should be, you know, green and yellow, right? Or they shouldn't even be buttons. Like, we don't need those. We want something totally different. Like, how do you sort of build up that the ability to do it? I'll tell you one yeah. thing that I've seen: people's opinions, uh, you know, whether rational or irrational. Um, get really, can get, become really focused when you can share a visible, tactile, tangible insight that came from somebody who's consuming your product or your service. So if you could go out into the world and you could gather tangible insights, whether it's photos or maybe some audio or some video or just notes and observations, sketches, and come back with some kind of aha. You know, uh, I saw something out there that I don't think any of us have seen yet, and here's what it looks like. And this is what I heard from that, that customer who's actually paying us right now for our service. And they said they'd pay us more if we did this. So uh, why don't we talk about this a little bit more? Yeah. And, and so do you think, so when you say, you know, do things that don't scale, um, you know, lots of people will say, you know, uh, move fast and break things or, you know, fuck it, ship it, just see what happens. Um, and, you know, do things that don't scale is sort of maybe an excuse to do some crazy stuff in your gut rather than, you know, a data-driven approach. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is it that, is it sort of an excuse to do things that sort of like, you know, I have a, or, or a, a permission, I guess, not an excuse, permission to do things that are just, I, I believe this, I'm gonna try it, and then you gather the data, and the data ultimately is important, or is there, is it always, you know, sort of the instinct that keeps driving and keeps, keeps it growing? Yeah, I think in, in the early, early stages of a product or, or a feature that someone's thinking about, um, I'm not sure how useful data actually is. If you don't have meaningful scale to test it against, uh, it may actually be misleading. Uh, so I'd say, uh, I mean, the way that we do things is we have an idea for something. We, we now have kind of built into the culture this idea that it is okay to do something that doesn't scale. So be a pirate, go out into the world, and get a little test nugget, come back and tell us the story that you found. So. Yeah. And so do you, have, do you have a couple examples of people like, you know, pirates on the Airbnb team, things, people gone out, they've come back and said, you know, look at this. I mean, the classic, classic story is, is one that's legendary in the company. It's one that every employee knows about. It's one that almost every host knows about now as well, uh, which is that in 2009, <coughs> we're sitting there with Paul Graham in his office down in Mountain View, and we're looking through uh, New York City search results, and we had all of 40 listings in New York at the time, so it's pretty easy because there's only two pages. <laughs> and we, dis we notice a pattern. There's like some similarity between all of these, these 40 listings. And the similarity is that the photos sucked. The photos were not great photos. People were you know, using their camera phones or using their images from Craigslist, which are like downsampled 3,000 times. Like, <laughs> so the, the images, some people like took pictures at night. It actually wasn't a surprise that people weren't booking <laughs> rooms because you couldn't even really see what it is that you were paying for. So um, I remember we had a conversation, and this is in the context of going to meet the people. Um, and we kind of look at each other and we're like, why don't we just take photos? <laughs> what if we just rent a camera for one weekend, right? This is not some like crazy investment that's gonna cost thousands of dollars, right? It could cost like, however much it costs to rent a camera, which it turned out was like 100, 100 bucks. Um, why don't we just do this one weekend and see what happens? And I have to tell you, um, so many things came out of that one kind of thought of like, well, we, we could have killed it right there on the spot, right? We could have said, well, 
how are we going to shoot every host in New York? And then what about every host in D.C. and Miami and Chicago? And then what about Paris? Like, yeah, it doesn't we, scale. It doesn't scale. That'll never work. We have a company to run. We can't be taking photos all day. <laughs> and so it could have been really easy to shoot that down. Um, but there was this kind of like moment of like, yeah, let's go see what happens. Like we don't have to look at data to tell us that like this is worthwhile just to see for an experiment one weekend. So. So many things happen, longer than I probably have time to tell you tonight. Oh, you have time. Okay. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so uh, well, one of the things that came out of it is revenue, which at the time we were making in fees in our pocket $200 a week for months. Like the, the graph looked like this, and sometimes it dipped at $200, right? It was steady. You could, you could predict exactly what their graph was going to look like the next month, $200. Right? And clearly, that's not enough to sustain three guys living in San Francisco, uh, which is why we, uh, you mentioned uh, we raised a round of funding, and we call it the, uh, uh, the Visa round. And that's what kept us going, is just funding the company off of credit cards. Um, uh, this is <laughs> the Visa corporate was not involved in that at all. It was really just they were actually chasing you. Right? <laughs> right? We'd max out a card, then we'd have to go to MasterCard and raise a MasterCard round. And then... I think we tried to get an Amex, but we got declined at that point, so we couldn't even go to do an Amex round. Yep. Yeah, they, uh, our business plan didn't fly with them. Um, but uh, I'm getting off tangent here. Let's see. Uh, so, yeah, oh, $200, right. So, like, zero to no revenue. And I have to tell you this. We take these photos. We come back the next week, like, the next day, that Monday. We post them. And revenue within the course of one week goes from two hundred dollars to four hundred dollars. Sick. Sick. Yeah. <laughs> I remember looking at Nate, who's our, who's my technical co-founder, and being like, Nate, like, are you sure? <laughs> Do you want to double check that? So of course we double checked it, and like, oh my god, like. Something magical just happened here because for eight months prior, there was no growth. Barely did it ever cost $200, and suddenly we just doubled in a week. So we, uh, we print out the graph. I'll never forget this. We go back to Y Combinator because we're in the middle of the program. We sh put it th like throw it down on the table, and we're like, Paul, check this out. <laughs> and Paul had this funny moment. He comes running up to you and goes, what are you still doing here? <laughs> go back to New York City. <laughs> He does this thing with his finger where he points at you. Everybody's probably seen that. Um, so we're like, oh, okay. Of course. Of course. I, all right, I guess it makes sense. So we went back. Brian and I flew out. Nate's back in San Francisco coding. We're, um, we're, we fly into New York on a Thursday night. We schedule shoots with, with hosts throughout Manhattan and Brooklyn. We rent the camera from Union Square, and we each of us have our ca Brian has a camera, I have a camera, tripods, the whole thing. It's like 30 pounds of camera gear, and we're trudging through snow because it's the middle of February. And uh, going door to door, taking more photos. We're meeting the people. We're actually, not only that, but we're actually staying with the people. <laughs> if on Airbnb. On Airbnb. If you ever want to understand your product, uh, go stay in the home of your customer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. So, so all of that has led, obviously, to you know, tremendous success. And I think you know, that when, I, when you recently, when I've been reading, you know, it's like, oh, you know, these guys have figured out how to go from search to social, and it's this huge shift, and now you've got wish lists and all these things. And again, though, this was about stars versus hearts, right? And mm. icons, right, in yeah, some icons. way. So we'd love to, to sort of dive into the details of kind of that conversation. Like, did you have sort of one side of the table, one was pounding the table for stars, and the other side was sort of saying hearts, and, and ultimately the hearts won, and then you end up like shifting the direction of the whole company? Like, how? How did you sort of have like go from literally a conversation about icons to a pretty fundamental shift in the way that your your members use the site and what the service offers? You just nailed it on the head. There was a boardroom discussion. We had the stars on one side of this long table, the hearts on the other. It was this back and forth debate. It went on two days. We had to get a media. No. Um, it was actually, I think, this, uh, the, this to set up and frame this question. I think it's important to, to um, talk about culture and what, what kind of culture you create. Um, because it's, it's the culture that led to the question that you're asking. Uh, creating an environment where uh, people can s see a little glimmer of something and basically throw dynamite on it. 
and blow it up to become something bigger than anyone could have ever imagined. And that comes by having a culture that supports that. So what happened is uh, we had uh, one of our, our designers, he's actually, this is his very first project. He just started at the company. And uh, we said, hey, why don't you go, uh, just to kind of get familiar with, with the site and the service and the ins and outs, because there's a lot of intricacy behind the scenes that a lot of people, you can't really see. So he said, you know, get under the hood a little bit, um, and actually, um, we did this. We gave him a small project because when, when you start at the company, you ship on day one. Every engineer, every designer ships on day one. So we always find some small thing to give every new member to the product team so they can experience shipping. And it doesn't matter if it's code or design uh, from day one. So what, I mean, what that does is it shows you how fast we can move. Like, it kind of like sets that standard right away. Um, but so this designer. Uh, we gave him. Uh, we wanted to improve the uh, the star functionality, which is uh, was your way at the time. This is like uh, over a year and a half ago to uh, to save. If you saw a really cool listing on the site, you could you could click the star and it would save to a list somewhere. And uh, we said, well, why don't you go take a look at that? Come back to us with uh, what do you think? So he, he comes back and he says, I have it. And I go, what do you mean you have it? You want to spend the day on it? <laughs> He goes, well, I, I think, you know, the stars, it's kind of like, you know, you see that in email, and you see that in kind of utility-driven things. But he's like, the service is so aspirational. Why don't we tap into that? And he goes, well, I'm going to change this to a heart. And we're like, wow, okay. That's, I mean, that's interesting, and, and we can ship it. So we did. Um, and when we ship it, we, we put a little, you know, the code in it so we could track it and see how behavior changed. And did you ship it, like, to everyone, or did you ship it to a sub, like 10%, or was it A-B tested, or was it just like, ship it? Um, I think it just shipped. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we do I was hoping you would say that, but I just like, had to we, ask. You know, we, do, we do put things out to certain percentages of people, and we get data, and then we iterate, and then we roll out to everybody. I think that was like, you know, it's so, it's just an icon. Let's just roll it out. Let's just be pirates and like, let it go. <laughs> and that's, um, that's what happened. So the next day, we're looking at the data, and it was kind of like one of those like revenue moments. It was like 200 to 400. It was like, wait, how many people clicked on that in the last 24 hours? Can you check the data? Like, it was one of those moments all over again. And sure enough, the, in the engagement uh, had gone up over 30% just by switching an icon. And we're like, hmm, this is kind of interesting. Let's watch this for like another day or so. Uh, so that week, we kept our eye on this this behavior on this new icon, and all the while, we're starting to dream. We're starting to be like, wow, if, if we tapped into something bigger here, if we could actually connect at a deeper level with someone's aspirations about staying in a treehouse or a castle or a boat, like, what else could we do with this? Um, and we started to realize, it was in these conversations, that uh, all this amazing content, right, these, these incredibly one-of-a-kind listings around the world, the Frank Lloyd Wright homes, the, uh, the villas, the igloos, uh, were, were hidden behind search, right? You couldn't discover these amazing places unless you knew the city that they were in. But no one's going to search for some random mountain town in Austria where there's this really cool igloo because <laughs> you don't even know that the city exists. Um, so we said, well, what if we were to found a product or a way to unlock all of these amazing listings, which, by the way, were being professionally photographed. Uh, <coughs> not by us. <laughs> uh, I'll tell that story in a second. Um, but what, what if we created a product that could unlock all of these unique listings for people who just want to browse? They just want to They just want to go take a trip without leaving their desk, without leaving their chair. And so, sure enough, this whole product kind of came together, this, this notion of, of wish lists, like tapping into... Who, ha who here in the room has a place that they want to go some someday in the world? Every single person has an image in their mind of some fantastic place somewhere on this planet that one day they will want to visit and experience. What if we could tap into that? And did you did you sort of set then as you iterate on that? Are you setting are you setting goals for those features? So. <coughs> you know, moving from a heart from a star to a heart is a 30% increase, and so now we're gonna try some other things, and we're gonna be looking for percent, you know, objective measures, percentage increases in engagement or clicks or whatever. Do you, do you guys sort of run the product yeah. funnel that way? Oh yeah, I mean, believe me, there, there's a there's a creative and intuitive process that's also backed, you know, by data. Like I think like the creative will will lead in some cases. We're like we'll have this this 
our imaginations will run wild about, wow, what if, what if we can do this? Like, we don't have any data to support it yet, but what if we just did a tiny little experiment and see what happened? And then, then we'll pull in data, and of course we'll track it. So now we have a great baseline of what engagement looks like for wish lists. And so we have a team that's working really hard to figure they have a new goal, and it's, it's different from 30%. It's, it's much higher. So, uh, and then we can track that with data, and we run all kinds of uh, design tests to, to figure out, um, you know, do you do in one click? Do you let people create lists? Do they share it to Facebook? Like, there's a million permutations on it that we're all kind of like trying out at any given time. Nice, nice. So, so the, the wish list led to sort of the infinite scroll, right? So you had the photos, the infinite scroll. You open source the infinite scroll. And, you know, one of the things I hear when I talk with product teams is sort of, you know, sort of a chicken or egg engineering or design, kind of which came first. And so with that, was that a engineering solution to a design challenge? Was that a, was that a designer's sort of wish, you know, and then, or, or a use of an engineering sort of innovation? Like, how did that work? And, and also at Airbnb, you know, your ratio of designers to engineers is pretty different than Google, for instance. Um, and, and so would love to just have, you know, your thoughts on kind of that chicken or egg issue and sort of that, that you know, how do you create a collegial environment Cool, and, and you asked me that question before and, and actually thought about it, um, and I realized something um, about this whole chicken and egg thing. I realized that I think it's something bigger than that. Like, I think my answer to that question is that it's actually, it's about designing the farm. And? And? <laughs> <laughs> it's about designing the culture where the chicken and egg can create um, it's about creating a, an environment and a way of thinking that um, you can have, you know, co-collaboration between design and engineering in new and different ways. And, and this is exactly what happened with, with uh, what Finn's talking about, which is that with wish lists, so picture this. We have now have these, we have over two million uh, professionally shot images of listings all over the world, which were hidden behind search. So now we're unlocking them, we're making them accessible to browse, and we want to show off those big images. However, as anyone in the room who codes know, is that you, big images slow your page down. And if you slow your page down, then people bounce and you lose uh, potential customers. Um, and that's, that's it's just a terrible experience. Nobody likes a slow website. Um, so because I think we designed the right farm, we had uh, this moment where we said, we're gonna go for both. We're actually gonna go for big images and infinite scrolls that people can get lost in this amazing content and just continuously find and discover these beautiful listings all over the world. And it was this notion of going for both, that you don't have to compromise. Like, compromises exist, don't get me wrong, but like, that's like a last resort, right? You start by going for both. It's not like an either or, it's an end. It's a both end. Right. And so, what happened is that uh, the, the engineering team and design teams, they started to like look around and see like, okay, well who else has solved um, this particular problem with big images, infinite scroll moves really fast. And um, they actually couldn't find a solution out there. So <laughs> at that moment, they're like, hmm, you could see them like salivating. They're like, yes, like let's create it. <laughs> let's solve this problem ourselves. And you know what? Their back's against the wall. They, we had the craziest, tightest deadline. They actually not only shipped the product on time, but they invented something new in the process. And they called it uh, infinite.js, which they've now open sourced and shared with the, the uh, developer community. And what's cool about that is it, um, it definitely earned some street cred for the engineers on the team. Uh, but also, uh, there's multiple engineers who connected with that. They saw that we were doing, they're like, oh my god, that's really interesting. I want to even learn more about this company. They want to learn more about that company. They want to. They eventually apply, and we actually got new talent. There's new engineers on the team because they saw what came out of Infinity.js, and all of that. So we had a great product. Uh, we got to open source the community, and uh, we got to bring on some great talent because of it. Because we started with both. If we compromised at the beginning, that never would have happened. No, that's awesome. So, so we're. Uh we're running over time, but, but um, just last thing, uh, a piece of advice for the designers in the room from, from you on, whether, whatever, whatever you like, founding a company, you know, building what they love, whatever you want, or just one piece of advice that, that they probably don't read in a book or, or, or hear every day. Hmm. Um, I maybe have a couple things. One is that I'm often just 
anytime somebody comes to me with something, I'm like, my first instinct is when I look at it, it's like, think bigger. That's my instinctual piece of advice. Think bigger. Whatever it is, like, bl like blow it out of proportion and see where that takes you. Um, you know, there's, there's so many constraints on, on, certainly on startups, like, you know, whether it's financial constraints or, or resources, uh, you know, show me startups that, that's not resource constrained. <laughs> I'd love to meet that startup, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's tough sometimes because you, you gotta ship, right? You gotta move fast. Uh, it's tough sometimes because you kind of get lost, like converging, 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 so we can ship, ship, ship. And so I find it's often healthy to just say to somebody, think bigger. Come back to me when you've thought about that times 100. Like, show me what that looks like. That's awesome. Thank you so much for coming out. I really appreciate it. It was great. Thanks.